heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, we break down the market action as equities trade in the red and NVIDIA drops for the first time since its blowout earnings report. Plus, we'll talk artificial intelligence as the Biden administration weighs how aggressively to regulate new artificial intelligence tools like ChatGPT. And amid recent turmoil in the US banking system, one fintech startup it saw revenue surge. We'll discuss why. Plus, so much more throughout the show, including where public markets are currently trading. Ed, we're seeing a little bit of a dismal feel to the Nasdaq today. We're dropping about seven tenths of a percent. Nervousness, nervousness out there that maybe some of the economic data in the U.S. is just too strong. The Federal Reserve is still going to have to cool this economy. The jolts data, basically job openings, looking much better than any single economist out there had anticipated. But what's interesting is you weave in, therefore, perhaps the sell-off, well, the buying that we see in two-year yields actually just dipping a little bit. That's all around where we go in terms of the debt debt ceiling as well, whether we get some sort of agreement finally pushed forward. We're hearing from Kayleigh Lyons just at the end of the previous show on that. But what's notable is also the fact that, yes, economic data in the US perhaps signing too much on the positive side. And over in China and Europe, that PMI, that manufacturing data looking weak. So we sell off once again in terms of those US listed Chinese stocks. Let's move on and see what's happening elsewhere in the world of technology. I'm looking at what's happening in the world of crypto because what a dire amount, month. We end up the month of May down more than 8%. This is the worst since November when FTX collapsed, of course. And so there's significant perhaps pullback in some of the gains we'd seen going on in the crypto world. But dig into some of the micro names that we're seeing on the move today, Ed. Yeah, some of that nervousness you're talking about certainly coming from earnings. Hewlett Packard. Enterprise, the maker of networking or uh, office infrastructure tools, down 7%. Pretty big decline. Its forecast for the current period really coming in below expectations. HP Inc., not to be confused with, the maker of laptops, missing sales in the quarter just gone, the fiscal second quarter. That giving some concern around demand for PC. But Bloomberg Intelligence, our colleagues there, saying actually there was evidence that the market for PC is bottoming out based on what HP Inc., had to say. Tesla down 2%. Elon Musk over in China giving back some of its recent gains coming off a two-month high. Elon Musk photographed having dinner at a restaurant in China. He eats at restaurants just like the rest of us. Not sure mere that's mortals. having much waiting on the stock, <laughs> but a lack of news for us mere mortals driving Tesla. Action in the chip space actually really interesting. Intel making significant gains, now up 4%, have been up significantly higher after the CFO said revenue in the current period will come at the upper half of its previously guided a projection or range that giving investors some confidence and then Nvidia down 3.7 percent is actually its biggest drop since February but remember we're coming off a record close uh, uh, Tuesday evening and of course 24 hours after Nvidia touched a one trillion dollar market cap for the first time some profit taking perhaps yeah maybe just maybe and we've got to think about the profit taking more broadly because an awful lot of the rally that we've seen so far this year has been thanks to just a very few names. And that's highlighted by the recent report coming from Joanne Feeney. We're pleased to welcome her to the show, Ed. Partner and portfolio manager over at Advisors Capital Management. And I read your note with real interest as we were, of course, still trying to muddy through the macro, what's happening in terms of debt ceilings and the like. But talk to us just how important a certain few names of ultimately tech stocks have been to the rally so far this year. Yeah, Caroline, you know, we get a lot of inquiries from our clients about how much the market has gone up this year and is this a good time to get into equities? And when you break it down, there are really two stock markets. There's the Super 7, the biggest tech and consumer companies like Amazon, Tesla, Microsoft, Apple, Google, obviously NVIDIA, uh, that have surged. On average, as of Friday's close, they were up 67% year to date, whereas the rest of the market was only up 0.3%. And, and that really does tie into two narratives. One, the, the growth opportunity related to AI on the one hand, and then the rest of the market, which is all about recession risks, interest rate risk, inflation risk, as we're seeing materialize today. Let's dig deeper into the AI equation, because yes, NVIDIA now back below that one trillion, but still basically what a surge. Are we putting too many eggs in just a very few baskets? Are you on the sort of Kathy Wood side of the equation that there are other companies that are going to win here and you should start looking at better valuations out there. 
Yeah, Caroline, it's hard to tell how much uh, we're going to get out of AI over the long term, but it's pretty clear that the companies that are ma that are enabling AI, whether it's through the chips like NVIDIA provides, or whether it's the software and deployment like Amazon Web Services, Google, Microsoft are enabling. What I think investors recognize is that even though we don't know all the details, we know that AI and its spread across the economy is going to provide years of growth for these companies. And that's a step change in what we expected these companies to be able to do you know, just uh, some months ago. And so I think that that's warranted. It, it isn't to say that there aren't opportunities out there and you know, investors can look for those, but we think these are solidly in the middle of this and it's a less risky way, I think, to play the AI move over time. And then you can look beyond that into companies adopting AI in, in industrials, in healthcare. There are plenty of opportunities out there. We'll learn more about them as time goes on. Joanne Cathy Wood joined our programming, our colleagues in Asia overnight. She's moved her focus on from NVIDIA, Tesla to the next big bet. Have a listen to what she had to say. We are really happy that, you know, investors who uh, own uh, benchmarks like the NASDAQ and, and QQQ still own NVIDIA. They own it in some of our portfolios, but we're on to the next thing. NVIDIA is a hardware stock and sure it has some software, but uh, the history of hardware and software is the bigger beneficiary over time is going to be software. Is going to be software. I think you note that investors are looking to move money into software, which can mean a broad range of things, right? Cloud, SaaS, enterprise. What are the corners of that subsector that interest you? Oh, yeah, and there, there are going to be many. I mean, the, the adoption of, of AI into software tools uh, across you know, multiple uh, end markets, I think, is significant. You know, we own a company, for example, called Splunk in our growth strategy. They are a big data analytics company, and AI is going to play an increasingly important role there. From NVIDIA's perspective, you know, the tying of hardware to software is actually pretty critical to what they're enable, uh, enabling their customers to do. It's also why their gross margins are going up. And so you know, we see in hardware and software to be more and more tied over time, which I think is why you know, NVIDIA uh, is such an interesting opportunity here. Not to say one should potentially take a little bit of profits at this time, which we did for clients actually after they reported. But going forward, yeah, there, there are going to be plenty of opportunities in software as well. Yeah, Carrie, the point that I'd make as well is like this obsession with a small group of U.S. domiciled names, right, the mega cap tech. But if you look at the commentary of the broader market, particularly the bond market, when we think about this economy and global inflation, mm. everyone's got an eye on China. Mm. And, well, Elon Musk is there at the moment, isn't he, as well, that you were just highlighting a bit earlier. I mean, Joanne, to that point, how much, when you're looking at the macro, when you're looking at what's happening here in the U.S. and everyone seeing the seven winners, the rest leaving behind when we think about where inflation's at, how much are you looking for your investor base at, oh, China, Europe being opportunities or being just areas you need to stay well away from at the moment? You know, there's always a role for international exposure in, in portfolios. We have actually separate international strategies in addition to some strategies owning some international names. China clearly has become more of a concern. I think investors are overly optimistic about how much the reopening will be able to drive demand in the near term, uh, which isn't to say that China is not going to be a very important source of consumer demand. They have, you know, massively moved uh, a big chunk of their population into the middle class, and that's going to be a foundation for buying over many, many years. So, you know, overall, there are some attractive valuations. Our approach is to look for companies uh, in countries as opposed to investing in countries as a whole. And that way we can hand select as we do in all of our strategies. You know, back to the, the hardware side, the advantage we're seeing that, that Ed mentioned, the focus on U.S., I think comes from the deep moats, right, that our companies have created around this technology. You know, I was a semiconductor analyst for 10 years, and one of the key things there was digging into the technology advantage that companies like NVIDIA and, and Google teaming up with Broadcom to develop an alternative uh, big chip to be able to do these AI training uh, computations it shows that mode is very deep. It supports their margins. So I think it's not wrong for investors right. to recognize that the source right, of, of a lot of the gains are going to be in these U.S. companies. You know, we, we learn that, that one morning a market does not make. But it is interesting that there's more emphasis right now on current risks, rates, recession. 
How much is that going to impact the technology sector going forward, do you think, from this moment right now? Yeah, gr great, great thought there, Ed. You know, as I said, we have two stock markets right now. We have the investor focus on which companies out there can actually provide years of growth with or without a recession, right? That's secular growth, and, and now it's been revealed uh, in AI that that's going to be significant. And then you have the rest of the market, Ed, and I think that's the market where they're going to be really focused on those recession risks, and rightly so, right? This, the jolt data this morning suggests that the Fed's going to have to raise rates uh, again instead of pausing, and it really throws into doubt the, the Fed being able to cut rates uh, towards the end of the year. And that makes investors worry that those higher rates are going to constrain lending. That's actually going to trigger a recession. The Fed obviously would like to avoid that. So there's a, just a, a massive amount of uncertainty right now, and we're seeing it in the prices of stocks in the rest of the market where secular growth isn't as big a driver, where the cyclical concerns are far more important. But the patient investors should really look beyond this. Equities do a terrific job over the long term of delivering uh, the ability to build wealth. So it's an opportunity potentially to get some of those companies in the rest of the in the rest of the market and build those positions now mm. while risks are, are high. And if you're a long term investor, you can look beyond that and build really solid diversified portfolios and take profit in the seven names that have driven us thus far. We've done some of that. A absolutely. You know, we're actually slightly now underweight NVIDIA. We've been overweight uh, for the last year. And, and I think it's appropriate to make sure that the risk exposure you have in a portfolio is balanced against, you know, how the uh, potential return from here is now confronting uh, the, the level of risk that we see, you know, across the global economy. Joanne Feeney, partner, portfolio manager, at Advisors Capital Management. One morning a market does not make, but it's good to get the snapshot view. Thank you very much. Now, coming up, fintech startup Breck seeing revenue surge following the banking turmoil in the US. We'll discuss why next. This is Bloomberg. Credit card startup Brex has seen a surge in usage of its products following this year's regional banking turmoil. The fintech company on track to reach roughly 500 million in recurring revenue over the next 12 months of its, if its current pace of growth continues. Joining us now to discuss is Brex co-founder Enrique Dubagra. Enrique, what's driving this? That's a pretty big build-up in, in forward-looking revenue, right? Yeah, first, thank you so much for having me here. Um, so we we're actually announcing that there's two products that crossed over 100 million in revenue, which is our Empower product, which is um, replacing Concur for travel and expense for most businesses, and also our business accounts, right, which can do operational you know, payments, uh, deposit checks, all the kind of like traditional banking activities for a business in one place. And both of them crossed over 100 million. So now we have over three products that, Across 100 million in revenue, and that's something that we're like really, really excited about. So, the 100 million in annual recurring revenue for the business accounts unit in Empower, Bloomberg sources saying that company wide annual recurring revenue on track for about 500 million. What is it that makes Brex so attractive to startups that you've done business with since the fallout of SVB? So, I think there are two kind of main growth drivers. The first one, uh, is our, actually our enterprise segment of the business. So Empower, which is our spend management solution, has been serving customers such as DoorDash, Coinbase, Indeed, Das, Glassdoor, Lemonade, et cetera. And um, I think both startups, mid-sized companies, and large enterprises have been attracted to our product because it's super easy to use uh, for employees. You know, you can just swipe your card and your expenses are done. It's extremely global, so it works all over the world for all your subsidiaries all over the world. And that's been like growing a lot as remote work grows and people are hiring internet, a lot of focus on experience. The second one is our banking product. Um, and I would say that, yes, the regional banking crisis definitely had, um, we didn't know if it was going to be net positive or net negative for Brex. We got that question a lot. Now we know it, it was net positive. Customers did come and stay with Brex. And that also drove a lot of growth for the company.
You know, Caroline, I think you and I will never forget that Friday where the SVB story unfolded. We did that special program, but we learned so much about how startups manage their finances, the type of funding that they seek beyond just raising capital from VCs. And what was interesting was Silicon Valley Bank was so intertwined with the startup sector because not only was it offering lending, but offer in many ways venture debt. And yeah. Enrique, that, that's an area that you've been working in as well. How much are you seeing startups getting into cash burn, needing to get further money to deploy, but don't want to raise equity? Is venture debt still a big part of your business? I would say that um, venture debt is a very small part of, um, you know, it's definitely an experiment that we tried and we continue to do it in small amounts, but it's, it's not mainly why customers come to us. The main way uh, our business account customers come to us is because of their operational banking. So running payroll, wires, ACH, checks, making their kind of day-to-day -day banking. So a lot of startups, they keep a lot of their funds in some of the big banks, but they keep you know one, two, three, four months of money with us to be their day-to-day -day partner that really understands them. And where are these companies coming from? You're obviously focused on allowing these companies to be global, to travel, to, to grow. But are they largely US-based companies? Are you seeing this becoming much more of an international play? These are, a lot of them are global companies. So over 50% of the companies that we serve uh, have global employees. Um, all of them have US employees. We, we only serve you if you have some sort of US operation for a bunch of regulatory reasons. Uh, but a lot of them are global companies. And we serve, as I said, from startups that just were born to, you know, customers that were from SVB, also to kind of like larger enterprises like Indeed, DoorDash, and Coinbase. I have a sneaky suspicion there's a few more AI players looking to bank or being born at the moment. And Ed, I mean, every day we're discussing the exuberance around that. Yeah, it reflects the conversation we had 24 hours ago, right, with Rex Salisbury. It's about what AI can do for existing fintech. Players. And I guess, Enrique, that's my, my, my question for you. How is AI going to boost your offering? Where are you investing uh, to jump on the bandwagon, so to speak? I think AI is going to completely transform our industry. Um, and I would say there's a couple different places, right? You can think about it, some in the employee experience. How can you make it even easier for employees to do their expenses or not have to do them at all, you know, make the, all of that automated? We also announced earlier this year Kind of like uh, you know a CFO for everyone, where if anyone has any questions, you know you can just ask this chatbot, and they will respond to you. So you don't have to waste the finance team's time with questions they already know the answer to. All the way to like accounting and operations, I think it's going to completely revolutionize and transform our industry. And we're investing very, very heavily um, into the development of new capabilities and and. Uh, you know, I think we're we're over the next few months. You'll you'll see a lot of very innovative things coming out of Brex. Enrique, when does Brex go public? We don't have a timeline yet. Uh, we're not against being a public company, uh, you know, in any shape or form. Um, that being said, I would love to be a low volatility public company. Uh, we're not yet profitable, so we'll probably wait for that. Um, to happen before we go public. Other thing to remember is we're a six-year-old company. We were started in 2017. So I would say, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't have any pressure to go public yet. Uh, we're still quite young for a startup. And we understand you don't have any pressure to raise new venture capital yourself. I'm interested, though, whether, where you are in terms of the focus on being profitable, being capex positive and all this sort of good stuff. Are you, are you still trying to hire? Because you seem to be talking about developing, leaning into AI. How are you managing those costs? Yeah, I would say that, you know, um, we're still investing a lot uh, in one, our go-to-market organization, because the product is having so much traction that, you know, I think it, it is high ROI for us to invest in sales and marketing. Um, to acquire, you know, more customers faster. So we are investing there, and our investors are really excited about it. And then in the second area is AI. I do believe this is going to be transformational and a step function change. So um, I think uh, if, you know, if you're a company and you're not willing to invest in AI, you know, you're probably missing the next big shift. That being said, we do have a good business of a good business model. I think we can, uh, we have a plan to being, you know, cash flow positive without raising any more money. Enrique. Great to have some time with you again. Thank you, Enrique Dubergras, is the Brexit Co. CEO. Meanwhile, coming up, we're going to talk about 
You guessed it, Elon Musk, the Tesla CEO. He's been making the rounds over in Beijing. More on who he met with and any projects that he's mulling. That's next. Meanwhile, we've got to remember, we've still got earnings coming, dripping through the system. Salesforce, investors are going to be watching that one closely today after the bell. Company going to update us on its own cost-cutting campaign. Look, how is it going to provide us with the long-run revenue goals that it set itself? This is Bloomberg. It's time now for Talking Tech. First up, iPhone maker Foxconn Technology says it expects to more than double its revenue in the second half of the year, thanks in large part to sales of, guess what, artificial intelligence and the servers thereof. It's part of a move to generate revenue from other fields such as electric cars and AI. Honhai, that's the listed vehicle for Foxconn Technology, also working with NVIDIA on autonomous driving applications. And Baidu is looking to beef up China's AI scene. The internet company has set aside roughly $140 million to fund Chinese startups that specialize in generative AI. Baidu and its VC partners will accept pitches from prospective founders who will use its Ernie bot to build their own large language model before Baidu determines, well, who gets the seed funding? Plus, day two of Elon Musk's visit to China, and he's already met with more government officials. That says he looks to bolster opportunities in the country. Musk met earlier with China's Minister for Industry and Information Technology and stopped by the Ministry of Commerce. He also met with the head of the battery giant, CATL, sparking rumors of a potential collaboration. And Musk arrived in Beijing Tuesday, where he met with Foreign Minister Quinn Gan. And, I mean, Ed, overall, this is a focus. Another CEO, we've heard from Mercedes, we've heard from GM, we've heard from, well, Jamie Dimon really having to talk up that, look, these are still focused on China, despite some of the trade tensions, the tech tensions. Yeah, and in the statement issued by the Chinese government, Elon Musk is quoted as saying that he is against a decoupling from China. They'll continue to invest in China. It's, it's a really interesting two-way situation. 50% of Tesla's output was in out of Shanghai globally last year. And, you know, they, the Chinese government have given Tesla the freedom to operate mm -hmm. there as an independent U.S. company, which is rare. But again, it's a chorus of names, as you point out. And interesting, that potential rumouring around the big battery maker, because that's, of course, a big part of trying to have supply chain in the U.S. rather than depending on Chinese made goods. Right. Well, when Ford announced that it was going to make batteries in Michigan, licensing CATL technology, there was a big fallout, particularly mm. from the Republican Party. That relationship really closely watched. Yeah, one to keep an eye on. I'm sure we'll get more photos as his continued journey. Yep. So coming up, we're going to keep with the conversation. Dozens of AI industry leaders and academics calling for greater global attention to the possible threat of extinction from AI. Dan Hendricks, Center for AI Safety, joins us next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's check in on these markets halfway through the show, halfway through the trading day there. In. And we're looking at a slightly lower NASDAQ 100 at the moment. We're off by eight tenths of a percent. Bit of a concern, profit taking, call it, after the massive run up that we've seen in this particular benchmark. But also the worries that basically we're running too hot in the US. The Federal Reserve is still going to have to tame the growth, the jolts data showing that people are still really hiring. We see a little bit of movement in the two year yield on the back of that data that came roaring through. But remember, tepid growth coming from China in terms of PMIs and manufacturing data there, Europe too. Interestingly, taking the wind out of the sales of Bitcoin once again, we're actually off by more than 8% over the course of this month, the worst month since when FTX collapsed. Let's move it on and have a little look at what's happening in terms of the individual movers because we do still have earnings we do still have real news but we also have perhaps the first fall in nvidia since its roaring earnings that we saw last week we're off by about five percent call it profit taking after it hit that one trillion dollar mark we also though see intel on the back seeing an uptick up more than 3.8 percent higher as we see the cfo speaking at a td cowan event really discussing how maybe they're going to manage to be at the top end of the range when it comes to their forward-looking guidance hewlett packard enterprises though that disappoints on the back of its numbers ed down by some seven percent are we worried about compute spending at the moment we are still in a very difficult macroeconomic environment we've got to remember that 
but AI is still a big factor in those markets. Now, the US and EU are meeting up this week at the US-EU Trade and Technology Council, gathering in Sweden, where the EU is discussing plans to subject generative AI to additional rules. This is bigger than Europe. U.S. is important, but it is bigger than the U.S. But if the two of us take the lead with close friends, I think we can push something that will make us all much more comfortable with the fact that generative AI is now in the world and is developing at amazing speed. Meanwhile, Biden administration officials have been divided over how aggressively new AI tools should be regulated, a dissonance that has left the U.S. without a coherent response to the EU's proposals. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Anna Edgerton to break it down. Anna, I thought we were in a place where the US and EU were on the same page. You regulate the use case, the tool, rather than the underlying technology itself. Where have we gone wrong? Well, we were kind of on the same page. You know, the last TTC meeting came out with this joint roadmap that kind of agreed to pursue this risk-based approach, like you said, focusing on the use of the technology rather than the development of the technology. So AI use for things like critical infrastructure would be subject to higher levels of compliance. Now, ChatGPT changed everything, and that really showed us how a general purpose AI product, you know, something that's not inherently high risk, can become very risky on a societal level when it's used by hundreds millions of people every month for everything from, you know, helping with homework to, you know, more nefarious purposes. So that's what policymakers are grappling right with right now is how to treat these generative AI products and how to classify the risk of those. At the moment, though, Anna, does it even really matter if the U.S., for example, certain parts of the administration are divided? Because to me, it feels like the EU is going to be the first mover here with the AI Act. Well, and that's why the EU Act, the EU's AI Act is most important, is because U.S. companies are going to have to comply with this if they want to operate in Europe. So much like the GDPR did for privacy, the AI Act is going to kind of set a de facto floor for compliance. So that's what U.S. companies are worried about, is as they develop these foundation models that underpin this generative AI technology, if they want to operate in Europe, they're going to have to comply with those rules, whether or not the U.S. has passed its own policy. And th these companies are really looking for a champion in the Biden administration to go to the EU and say, listen, we don't think this policy is going to work the way it's imagined when it's implemented eventually. You know, so the reason why it matters that the Biden administration is divided is that these companies don't have that champion. They don't have anyone going to these multilateral discussions and really f expressing their point of view. There was a time where we thought that Vice President Kamala Harris was the champion, right? She hosted that meeting with Sam Altman, Satchez Nadella. The, the, the administration has made noises about they want to do something. But I'll, I'll go back to one point you made, policy. We haven't really heard any arguments for either side of where to focus regulation, particularly from this White House. That's right. Well, I mean, I will give the administration credit for putting forward some very well-received frameworks. You know, we have the risk management framework from the National Institute of Standards and Technology that had a lot of input from industry, from civil society. It's a very well-thought-out document. You had the White House putting forth their Bill of Rights for people who use AI products. But we don't have binding policy in the United States, and that's because the U.S. Congress is just now starting to you know, hold their initial hearings to educate lawmakers on what AI even is. So while the Biden administration has done a lot of work to kind of set non-binding guidelines, actually binding regulation is going to come from Europe once again. Anna Edgerton, we thank you for giving us well, the global perception of AI risks. Let's dive into some of the perceptions here in the United States, because there's been another open letter signed by a group of industry leaders warning of, this time, the risks of extinction due to artificial intelligence. It was published by the Center for AI Safety, which has mission to reduce societal scale risks from artificial intelligence. Joining us now to deeper dive on all of this and explain the center's own thinking is its executive director, Dan Hendricks. It's great to have you. Thank you, Dan. I'm just interested in how this first started, this whole mission statement that you put out there about some of mitigating the risks in line with potentially a nuclear war or indeed, well, a global pandemic. How did you have first have conversations with Sam Altman and Demis of, of DeepMind? Did they come to you? You go to them. 
So we created the letter largely because I knew that many people had concerns that AI could lead to extinction and that we should not just be treating it like every other tech issue, but instead as a global priority. So we created this letter to succinctly convey the shared concern, and then we disseminated it among some profs, and from there it sort of spread organically. And so there were some surprises in that uh, OpenAI signed it, Google DeepMind signed it, Microsoft signed it, as well as many of the scientists that built the current wave of artificial intelligence. What's interesting is I'm trying to understand also how you were born as a center for AI safety. Are you, so, were you funded by any of these businesses? What is the ultimate way in which you continue to deliver and do your research? So we started, we started a while ago and we're largely funded by a philanthropy. We're not funded by uh, Elon Musk or things like that. So we're just trying to reduce the risks from AI. I've been, uh, when I was, or as a graduate student at Berkeley, I've been researching safety for a very long time. So this has been a concern uh, that I've had for many years. And now finally, the AI technologies are getting to the point where it's becoming a lot more obvious to the scientific community that this is a large concern. A letter like like this probably could not have existed six months ago, but given the rapid developments, uh, a lot of people are changing their minds. A lot of experts are changing their minds of just about how severe the risks can be. Dan, I actually want to go back to Caroline's previous question quickly. Have you taken money from any AI executives that were signatories to that letter, the previous letter, basically key names in the field of AI? Uh, there, I'd have to check if we're having any uh, funding from any employees that are also concerned about safety. The AI community is particularly large. 90 plus percent of our funding is from open philanthropy, which is ind an independent philanthropy. One question that arose quite quickly when you put out the statement 24 hours ago is the rationale or motivations behind the signatories. Why are they doing this? I, I get it. There's a long-term broad concern about the risks from AI. But why do you think these leading names who want the field to advance signed the letter that you organized? Well, so many of them were on the boat of, we got to move as quickly as possible. Developing AI will be a generally good thing. But a lot of the scientists who signed this have recently changed their tune. Jeff Hinton, of course, helped create artificial intelligence, modern artificial intelligence. So did Yashua Bengio. But in recent months, now there's substantially more concern about there being rogue behavior, um, that these, these AIs could potentially lead to human extinction as they get more advanced. So for that reason, uh, I think that it's just because people are starting to see that this is moving extremely quickly. We don't understand how these technologies work. Work. It's difficult to steer them. And so that could potentially, they could be misused. Those things could potentially lead to catastrophic risks or potentially in the longer term extinction. Very quickly in response to your letter, there were those that note present and much more near term basic risks. Have a listen to Sasha Lucioni of Hugging Face who joined us yesterday. I personally see it a bit as a, as a magic trick, as, a, as misdirection, right? Um, I, I care very, very strongly about, for example, uh, data consent, for example, disclosing data sources, disclosing, disclosing transparency and model documentation. And instead of focusing on that, we're being directed towards um, these unsolvable risks. Are we paying enough attention to more near term and immediate risks from AI? I should certainly hope that the risk of extinction is not unsolvable or else we're in big trouble. So I think it's important as a society to manage multiple different risks. I think we can certainly do it. I, I also think that many of the risks from that currently affect us can take on more extreme forms later on. For instance, if the people developing these AI technologies have decisive control over them. That gives them extremely high power and power inequality with respect to AI is a concern that could potentially get out of control where a few people are calling the shots in society. So I, I think that it's important any competent form of risk management will address current, current ongoing harms as well as tail risks. So I think we need to have a complementary approach. Yeah, and Dr. Hendricks, the outcome from this, you've certainly stirred a lot of interest, people perhaps either aligning themselves, thinking that this is too much or indeed that we need to shine a light on this.
How do you think we ultimately take on these risks? You're very good at highlighting what the risks are. Is it regulation? Is it self-regulation? What do you think the outcome will be? Well, I think that self-regulation would be a useful start, but we wouldn't trust something like a pandemic or nuclear technology just to the scientists. We wouldn't say solve the AI or the nuclear arms race scientists. It's, it's not necessarily completely their purview. There are technical aspects to this problem, but there are also social aspects to this problem. So we wanted to just make sure that the public is aware that many of the AI scientists, we have AI scientists from all the top universities and many of the people who created it are concerned that it could even lead to extinction. So then policy tends to be more of a negotiation process. And so hopefully we can get those conversations started, recognizing that there are severe effects on the horizon, such as potentially extinction. So I think we need to treat it as a global priority and we need to work toward cooperating domestically, but also internationally, so that we're not caught in an AI arms race between different countries. The nuclear arms race brought us to the brink of catastrophe, and we don't want another arms race where we build extremely powerful technologies that could potentially destroy us all, and we just keep stockpiling them. That was not a good outcome for humanity. That could have gone substantially worse. I don't want the same to happen with AI, so hopefully we can cooperate starting today. Have you seen decent self-regulation thus far? on some of the more near-term immediate societal damage we're seeing, as many have referenced, you know, the bias already baked into some of the data that this is being built upon, the worries that the wrong people are being potentially stopped by police, the worries that the wrong misinformation is already circulating. Have you seen that tackled before we even get on to the much larger and more significant concern that you have about extinction? Yes, so I think we ought to be, if we can't address many of those uh, current risks, then I don't have much hope for us addressing some of these, these larger risks as well. I should say that um, the, there's a bit of a mix in uh, whether companies have been successful at making their AI technologies safe. There's some you know, notable uh, failures like with Bing's initial rollout where it was threatening users. But uh, some other technologies have been useful in uh, uh, being uh, relatively reliable and uh, mi mitigating their amount of bias. So th there are um, fortunate signs that there's some progress being made. I'm concerned, though, that since the AI companies are competing with each other yeah. and are locked in an arms race with each other, that there won't be enough time for safety, that they're going to de prioritize development over safety because if they if they don't prioritize development and making it as powerful as quickly as possible, then we won't be able to make it safe and bring the risks down to a negligible level. Is it a risk that by regulating, self-regulating or otherwise, we start to stifle out the new competitors, the smaller players, the academics that you're talking to within labs rather than the large players such as a, a Bing or a Bard or, a, or an OpenAI? I think that, uh, well, if we're concerned about academics, I think that that would largely be the government to be taking care of that. I think that we can definitely target some of these catastrophic risks um, uh, for models that are at a certain level of capability. That seems like a possible proposal. So um, we'll basically have to see with, with these negotiations. I'm largely just pushing for us initiating this process and trying to have broader societal cooperation, including international cooperation operation on these issues. Dan, how does the public reconcile that the signatories to your petition, your initiative, were the leaders in the field of AI, the AI evangelists, for want of a better expression, who are now apparently the AI doomers? How have we moved so quickly from leadership to concern in that field? I think that this is a natural part in any industry where initially it's move fast and break things, be risk seeking, tinker, throw stuff at the wall, see what sticks. But then we start shifting over to a more risk averse regime where when the technology starts affecting society on a larger scale, now people are actually using these AI technologies. And so we ought to be substantially more cautious with their potential outcomes. As well, it's getting a lot closer to human level intelligence. So earlier, two years ago, <laughs> they really weren't intelligent at all. But but it's quite conceivable that in the next few years that in many cognitive domains we have AIs that are as good as us or better. So I think that's one of the main things shifting this underlying change in tone. Because this AI arms race is making it move so quickly, uh, people are starting to think we need to rethink our priorities. Centre for AI Safety Executive and Research Director Dan Hendricks, thank you for your time.
Now, Elizabeth Holmes turned herself in at a minimum security prison in Texas yesterday to begin her 11-year, three-month sentence. The disgraced tech founder had been convicted of defrauding investors at her failed blood testing startup, Veranos, and she and her former business partner, Ramesh Balwani, must together pay $452 million in restitution to investors. Karen. Well, let's get back to it, Ed, because we've got more to discuss on artificial intelligence, if you could believe it. But we're going to talk about it on Wall Street, how hedge funds are actually dipping their toes into the pool of AI tools to handle all well, the boring stuff, the grunt work. We're on that next. This is Bloomberg. Wall Street. It's already filled with quants with computer wizards, but like, it's not stopping hedge funds from utilizing the powers of ChatGPT for the basics. You better to discuss all of this. Bloomberg News at Wall Street reporter Shanali Basak. And so, what is it? Junior hedge fund analysts, hallelujah, you don't have to do the basics, the grunt work here. Yeah, there's a reason that it only really works for the basics. I don't normally like to use personal examples, but I had gotten my degree in quant finance. And down over at NYU for the MBA program, what they do is they take all the students, they have them run through all this data, they put it through code under different market scenarios, and what they show you is that the code, the models don't always work. Mm -hmm. The point here being is two things. One, sometimes the data doesn't work. Sometimes it's just wrong. And the other times, the market is just unpredictable. It's why there's limitations to how ChatGPT could be used. But Caroline, there are things about ChatGPT that make this uh, kind of rendition of quantitative finance different than before. And that is natural language processing, generative AI that'll make it easier to read company reports, research reports, uh, news filings, and uh, even company transcripts to hopefully make it easier to parse through investing signs down to a Fed minutes to, to get signals on how dovish or hawkish something is. So it feels for now it's about productivity and workflow rather than perhaps getting an edge when it actually comes to your investing. Shanali Basak, short, sweet, but always to the point. We love it. Meanwhile, Ed, more on the VC's area for you. Yeah, let's get the VC spotlight. And first up, Canadian venture capital investors have about $10 billion of dry powder to spend on cash-hungry startups. They're going to need it soon, according to a report by the Business Development Bank of Canada's Venture Capital Unit. It also says many VC-funded companies face the risk of running out of money in the next 12 months without new financing, despite efforts to slow down their rate of cash burn. An early DoorDash backer, Pair VC, has closed a new $432 million fund for early stage investing. The fund is the firm's fourth and will continue its generalist strategy, investing across sectors including life sciences, healthcare, consumer climate and artificial intelligence, of course. The firm raised $160 million for its last fund in 2019. Plus, the Japanese government plans to double financial support for startup companies in innovative technology fields such as space development and artificial intelligence. Nikkei reporting Japan's cabinet will formally decide on the move as soon as early June. That's your VC Spotlight. This is Bloomberg. And what is going viral? It's the finale, Zed, of Succession and Ted Lasso. Warner Brothers Discovery, which of course owns HBO, said close to 3 million people watched the Succession finale on TV and its streaming app, HBO Max, in the US. A 68% improvement over the last episode of season three, according to the company. And meanwhile, it's the top trending topic on Google Trends, Ted Lasso's own finale. Ted Lasso has been born a boon, of course, to Apple TV, breaking into the Nielsen weekly streaming ranking in sixth place during the last week of April with this third and last season. Meanwhile, though, our Brits aren't watching it much. Right. It's unbelievable. I mean, Apple doesn't disclose numbers, but it's all everyone's talking about on social. Succession is on FinTwit. Three million doesn't seem like a lot in a country of 330, 330 million people. But as you know, we're both big fans. That does it for this edition, Cara, of Bloomberg Technology. Don't forget, so much to recap in what's been a short week packed with news on our podcast, Apple, Spotify, iHeart, wherever you get your podcasts from New York and San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.